Hello, I'm Martina Chung, head of S&P Global Sustainable One and president of S&P Global Market Intelligence. The theme of ESG and sustainability is as timely and relevant as ever. Market participants across the globe are navigating the transformation to a low-carbon, sustainable and equitable future for all. But in order to effectively measure this transition, you need to have timely and accurate data to clearly de define and understand the actual impact. At S&P Global, we are producing essential intelligence that demonstrates the power of social equity and the benefits of a more inclusive economy. Today, I'm here to talk to you about how gender fits into ESG and the broader economic benefits of a more inclusive society. As we all know, the ESG conversation has evolved rapidly over the past few years. We've seen climate change, social inequity, and corporate governance become focal points for investors, consumers, policymakers, and boardrooms. The past five years in particular saw increased momentum and social on social issues like diversity, treatment of employees, and companies' broader role in society, ES in ESG. The Business Roundtable adopted a new statement on the purpose of corporation in 2019 that reaffirmed their public commitment to stakeholder value. Stakeholders are increasingly holding companies to a higher social standard. At S&P Global, we also see gender as an increasingly important piece in evaluating the company's ESG performance through our Corporate Sustainability Assessment, or CSA. Through the CSA, we don't limit gender to only the social, but also apply this to the governance analysis. And here you can see the key factors that go into each dimension. To put this in perspective, for any company and any industry, out of the 100 questions we ask companies, approximately five are directly measuring gender equality metrics, and another four have gender overlays. In our analysis, we look at a combination of how prepared a company is in terms of the policies and management programs it has in place, as well as performance metrics. With gender topics, our scoring is very heavily focused on measuring performance indicators over policies and programs so that we measure a company based on what it does and less of what it says. Over time, as companies disclose increasing amounts of information on gender-related topics, we've enhanced the metrics that we use to evaluate companies' performance on important gender themes. In 2010, we included board gender diversity ratios, equal remuneration, workforce breakdown based on gender, and health and well-being, looking at childcare, maternity leave, paternity leave, and flexible working hours. In 2014, we included corporate governance policies aimed at enhancing representation of women on the board. And this year, we included discrimination and harassment metrics, workforce breakdown based on race and ethnicity, workforce ba breakdown based on other minorities. And we also included gender metrics in questions looking at hiring practices, employee turnover rates, employee engagement, and training and development. Since performance improves over time, so does our expectation of companies. For example, it no longer suffices to have one woman on the board to get full points for board diversity. As you can see in the chart, we have included board gender diversity in 2010, and the trend has, con has continued to move in the right direction. Additionally, through our ESG scores, we see how board representation of women has developed over time across various regions. The onset of COVID-19 has also put a spotlight on social issues, particularly how people across the globe saw a clash of professional and personal responsibilities. This was most evident when you examine the impact of the pandemic on women in the workforce. According to the UN Women, impacts from the pandemic on women and girls have worsened across the board. Women are looking at their livelihoods, are losing their livelihoods faster because they are more exposed to hard-hit economic sectors. In fact, it was projected that this year around 435 million women and girls will be living on less than $1.90 a day, including 47 million pushed into poverty as a result of COVID-19. Taking a step back, 
we see that the increase in female participation in the labor force throughout the 20th century across OECD countries. In 2018, the global labor force participation rate for women was about 49%, and for men it was 75%. That's a difference of 26 percentage points, with some regions facing a gap of more than 50 percentage points. And why is this gap significant? S&P Global conducted a study of women in the workforce in 2018 that showed increased female labor force participation in the U.S. alone could add almost $6 trillion to global market cap in 10 years. Prior to the pandemic, we were making progress in female representation in the U.S., albeit in small, in small ways. According to a study from McKinsey, through January 2015 and December 2019, the number of women in senior vice president positions increased from 23% to 28%, and in the C-suite from 17% to 21%. The same report noted that there had never been a year when women opted out of the workforce at higher rates than men. In fact, every year through 2019, the average overall attrition rate for companies was higher for men than women. And then the pandemic hit, helping to erase the progress made on the gender gap along with many barriers between personal and professional life. As an example, in last September alone, 865,000 women aged 20 and older left the workforce compared to 216,000 men with the same age, within the same age bracket, according to a National Women's Law Center analysis. According to research S&P conducted, the majority of women and men, 58%, reported spending increased time on childcare and family caregiving since the outbreak of COVID-19, and that is on top of the many hours they had previously devoted to both. The pandemic also increased the visibility into women's responsibilities outside of work, as women still take the lion's share of parental and family caregiving responsibilities. To sum up, when a crisis hits, the impact is never neutral to gender, class, or race. We see the impact the pandemic had on women, and if you drill down a layer lower, we see that black women in America were some of the hardest hit in the past year. The challenges black women face didn't materialize when the coronavirus pandemic began. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the economic status of black women has always been worse than average, with black women suffering higher unemployment rates than white men in every economic uh, recession of the past 50 years. S&P Global recently published a report titled, How the Advancement of Black Women Will Build a Better Economy for All. In simplest terms, our research shows the inequalities black women have faced, and which have become a drag not just on their bank accounts and their generational wealth, but also on the long-term national economic growth outlook. These inequities exacerbated by COVID-19 may curtail the post-pandemic recovery for black women in the absence of actionable policy designed to address these challenges. Prior to the pandemic, Black women in America faced several hurdles to success, particularly regarding educational and professional opportunities. The gap in annual wages between Black women and white women narrowed to just $744 by 1980, and we see it widen dramatically to more than $5,300 by 2019. On education, the differences between white women who received a college degree and black women widened from about 5% points in the, in the 1940s and 50s to 13 percentage points by 2019. Had we addressed these gaps, not only would greater equity have improved black women's prospects of weathering the pandemic, but it would also have contributed to overall GDP and growth of the U.S. economy. Given how closely education is tied to productivity, more college-educated black women would have added more than $100 billion to the U.S. economy over that time. And if the current uh, college-educated black women had also been in positions that better match their education and skill sets, the productivity boost would have granted a to- would have generated a total of $507 billion to GDP in that time. So what can we conclude from this? We need more data, and we need better data. For instance, a more robust sense of the qualitative difference between for-profit and non-profit education. Black women often work in lower-paying service sector jobs, regardless of whether they have college degrees. Institution type, 
is an important factor in determining economic returns um, of, uh, of college degrees. According to a 2018 Federal Reserve port report, 5% of white women who attended college went to a for-profit institution, whereas among Black and Hispanic collegegoers, this is nearly three times higher. The larger share of Black students attending for-profit colleges, where the quality of education varies, will likely limit the labor market opportunities afterwards. Once we have the data, we can analyze it. One option to consider is the CBO, or Congressional Budget Office-like score. This would show the impact legislation would have on the economic feasibility and accessibility to the workforce for women. Labor participation for women, and Black women in particular, has weakened to levels not seen in almost three decades. This kind of score would be a simple objective, nonpartisan measure. The right data would equip lawmakers with the tools to assess proper legislation, excuse me, proposed legislation, and its effect on women in the workforce. Now, despite all these challenges women have faced during the pandemic, globally there's a positive story to tell on how women in leadership roles have shined during this past year. In moments of crisis, women CEOs exhibited a different leadership style than men during the COVID-19 crisis. In a separate study we recently published, titled Leadership in Turbulent Times, Women CEOs During COVID-19, we examined the communication style of CEOs during the pandemic. We looked at sentiment analysis of earnings and transcripts of leaders of nearly 5,000 companies in the S&P Global Broad Market Index, or BMI from March 9th, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. First, I'll note that women CEOs are still significantly underrepresented. Women at companies in the S&P Global BMI accounted for 5% of CEOs as of January 25th, 2021, up just 0.1% since February 8th, 2020. Real estate and healthcare companies are around four times more likely to have a woman CEO than a company in the energy sector. Geographically speaking, some countries are ahead of others in terms of CEO diversity. Looking at the S&P Global BMI, Norway and Singapore score the highest with women representing 14% and 12% of women CEOs respectively. You see a linear regression that suggests the gender gap in the labor force explains about 13% of the cross-country variation in the CEO gender gap. To close that gap, policymaking could play a role. For example, countries with better access to childcare uh, are more likely to attract and retain a higher uh, share of women in the workforce. Only then, the larger numbers of women start a career, climb the ladder, and one day perhaps become CEO. You now see the composition of women CEOs. Let's dig into our findings. We found that women CEOs express language in the categories of empathy adaptability, accountability, and diversity, for example. Men CEOs were more focused on transaction-related words like performance and growth. In this next slide, we look at the context of flexibility, and we found women CEOs talking about agility, comfort, and financial flexibility, while men CEOs were mentioning predictability, redundancy, stability, and scalability. Lastly, in metric-related concepts and in word cloud form, to really visualize the point, women use terms like customer, engagement, customer satisfaction, mission, regulatory, while men CEOs mentioned EBITDA, profit, gross profit margins, EPS, and so on. So what do we take away from this? We see several opportunities for further research about women leaders in times of crisis and their role in creating social capital. Understanding women leaders have a, uh, to, understanding women leaders as role models and the value they bring to our society is a part of a changing vision of a world that needs to be more diverse, equitable, and sustainable. Our research indicates that countries and companies will need to do much more to ensure such a vision of the future. Foremost, they need more equitable participation in the workforce. We need more data so we can capitalize on the missed opportunities when companies and countries ignore women's potential. 
This is unsurprising, but comes at a time when women are reportedly pulling back or out of the workforce in greater numbers to care for others in response to COVID-19 related needs for healthcare, childcare, or education. As we have shown, women CEOs, though small in number, have a broader notion of leadership that places greater emphasis on stakeholder leadership in an area in an era when stakeholder capitalism is taking root. I will close by saying all of us, men and women, C-suite leaders, managers, and frontline employees have a stake in fostering equality in the workplace. The challenges to achieve this are significant, but we cannot ignore the even great opportunities and potential of a more equitable and inclusive society. Thank you to The Economist for hosting me, and thank you for listening.